speaker, there is a change in the program. Um, Hillary Vernon's talk will be uh, presented by Brittany Necros Hornby. I hope I got that right. Brittany, thank you. So yeah, unfortunately, Hillary couldn't be here tonight because she had to leave early, secondary to a family emergency. So I'm excited to share her information with you, even though I wasn't technically invited. So thanks for your attention. Um, so here I'm going to share her work, um, part of it that I worked with her on as well, regarding the clinical, molecular, and metabolomic studies in birth syndrome. First, I'm going to present data to you from our clinical study that we performed at the BARTH conference two years ago. And this recently was published in Genetics and Medicine in February. So please reference that if you have additional questions. Um, it's a cross-sectional, observational, single time point study in 42 affected individuals. We performed a multidisciplinary study, deep phenotyping project where we were looking to explore the interrelationships between clinical, molecular, and metabolite patient characteristics. The clinical study goals were to determine the MLCL to CL ratio, genotype and phenotype relationships. For this, we looked at cardiac size and function through echocardiograms that were performed by Dr. Reed Thompson. We looked at skeletal muscle strength, which I assessed via handheld dynamometry and manual muscle testing, endurance via the six-minute walk test, and quality of life measurements, which were performed via physical activity questionnaires that were completed by the boys or with the assistance of boys' parents if they were unable to complete them by themselves. We also collected biologic samples for further study to allow us to perform metabolomics analysis to identify further discriminating biochemical features. Here, this first diagram is showing the MLCL to CL ratio. These were performed by Fred Vaz in Amsterdam from dried blood spots, but, excuse me, blood spots via high performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry analysis. The specific ratio measured was the MLCL was the 52.2 and the CL was the 72.8. Uh, you can see here that there's a wide range of MLCL to CL ratios in our patients with Barth syndrome and they're all significantly above the normal cohort. Next, uh, this is information from our echo echocardiograms. Uh, 36 individuals received echocardiograms in our study. We did not perform echocardiograms on anyone who had had a heart transplant. Um, here you can see the z-scores on the y-axis and then the different cardiac parameters on the x-axis. The yellow bars on the graph represent the normal range. And as you can see, there's a widespread from normal to abnormal function and cardiac size across the Barth syndrome cohort. The six minute walk test was performed um, according to American Thoracic Society standards with modifications secondary to the space available to us. So our walking course was 50 feet as opposed to 100 feet. And it was on a carpeted surface as opposed to a hard surface, because as you guys know, the only hard surface in this hotel is in the lobby, so that wouldn't have been very good. Um, here are the results from our six minute walk test. These are looking at Z scores with a standard deviation from normal. Um, and the normal was calculated using a regression equation from the Cheddar et al. article that takes into account height given the delayed puberty that the boys with bar syndrome experience. So it might not be totally fair just to compare them to controls matched for their age in the literature. Uh, on average, you can see that patients with bar syndrome had significantly reduced endurance with Z scores on average of minus 4.39 with a range from minus 0 0.9 to minus 8.18. And you can see also that individuals in the oldest cohort tended to have worse performance. And we had a correlation between age and six minute walk test distance of minus 0 0.27. Next, uh, we compared adult strength measurements that I obtained via handheld dynamometry to published normative values in the literature. In addition to the knee extensors, the hip flexors, and the hip abductors, I also looked at hip extensors um, and knee flexors, but the normative values published by Bohannon in 1997 don't include normative values for those muscle groups. So that's why you see these included here. Um, you can see that our 
adults with bar syndrome have significantly um, decreased muscle strength in all of these muscle groups in comparison to controls, with the knee extensors actually being the weakest. They have knee extensor strength of approximately 29% of the, of the normative values in the literature, uh, hip flexor strength that is 48% of the normative values reported, and hip abductor strength that is 34% of the normative values. Unfortunately, there aren't as nice of normative values published for our pediatric population in regards to handheld dynamometry measurements, so I wasn't able to do that same exact comparison for our pediatric subjects. Here, what you're seeing, this next graph is showing us the adult versus pediatric strength measurements with, um, when they're normalized for body weight. And I'll be talking about this more in depth tomorrow morning when giving a talk that I was actually invited to provide to you guys, so looking forward to that. Um, here you can see that if you just looked at the adult and pediatric force measurements alone, not normalizing for body weight, you see that the adult ones are higher. But when we normalize for body weight, essentially the pediatric participants are stronger in all muscle groups in comparison to our adult subjects. So certainly the study had some limitations. It was a single time point observation in individual patients. It was an atypical environment for the patients and also strength and functional ex exercise capacity could possibly be affected by the time of day that they were assessed. Because I definitely know some of my friends at the end of the day were very tired, but also some of my friends at the beginning of the day were very tired from having been up late the night before. Um, so despite those limitations, we were able to find some pretty significant findings with our data analysis. We worked with a statistical geneticist, Dr. Dimitri Avopoulos at Johns Hopkins University, and he helped us to look for significant relationships, including uh, the MLCL ratio to um, six-minute walk test distance to left ventricular mass. Um, and we also had a nice correlation between the physical activity questionnaires and the distance walked on the six-minute walk test, as well as dyspnea and fatigue scores and the distance walked on the six-minute walk test. The dyspnea and fatigue were assessed via the modified Borg scale. We used multiple regression analysis via the statistical program R to help us uncover these relationships. Um, also, interestingly, uh, Dr. Varmopoulos also helped us look at relationships with three methyl glutagonic acid and individual amino acids, and we saw no relationship. Dr. Vernon also looked at um, in 22 individual mutations. 13 had a missense mutation, six had a nonsense mutation, eight had a splicing mutation, six had a small out of frame insertion or deletion, two had a small in frame insertion, and four had a large deletion encompassing several exons. And this is similar to the overall breakdown of the general Barth population. We did identify several mutations that appeared to be associated with a particularly severe MLCL to CL ratio, which are circled on this diagram in red. And we also found several mutations that appeared to be associated with a particularly mild MLCL to CL abnormality, which are circled here in blue. And we are certainly um, exploring this further in, the, in Dr. Vernon's lab through cellular modeling and functional studies. So in summary, what we learned from the research we did at the last conference are that skeletal muscle strength and endurance is almost never typical in patients with Barr syndrome, which is very different to cardiac function and neutropenia, which tends to wax and wane. The MLCL to CL ratio significantly correlates with both cardiac and skeletal muscle parameters. Um, we're hoping that these can have the potential to serve as quantitative endpoints for a therapeutic outcome. And we also identified potentially mild and severe MLCL to CL associated genotypes for further study. And we are looking at this both at this conference this year with our research project and in our clinic longitudinally to make sure this data that we found holds up. Next, I'm going to share information from Dr. Vernon's metabolomics analysis that she performed in conjunction with Dr. Yana Sandler's. Um, this was published in PLOS 1 in March 2016, so please reference that if you have additional questions. What, here, what they were looking at here was plasma metabolomics analysis in patients and match controls. They combined untargeted and targeted approaches to uncover biochemical effects in Barr syndrome. They first look at untar looked at untargeted H nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. They then looked at targeted 
liquid chromatography mass spectrometry guided by the previous HNMR results. Specifically, they were looking at acyl carnitines, amino acid, biogenic amines, hexoses, lysophosphatylcholines, and phosphatylcholines. This um, diagram is showing the results of the untargeted HNMR spectroscopy. The untargeted study evaluated greater than 500 metabolite groups, which were analyzed for statistical significance between cases and controls. OPLSDA analysis, which is similar to principal component analysis, was performed and showed a clear separation between cases, which are here represented by the green dots, and controls, which are represented by the blue dots. The nice thing about this study is that cardiolipin and 3-methylglutagonic acid were not included in the analysis, so this did not skew the results at all. This then is showing you the results of the LCMS analysis of the Barth plasma. Um, they then, here they looked at over 180 metabolites. You can see here the categories explored included amino acids, acenyl carotenes, and others. The amino acid analysis was important because it confirmed the prior studies published in 2012 showing a significant difference between arginine, proline, and tyrosine. They then utilized pathway mapping programs, including the Metacore module in the GeneGo software, to identify novel pathways showing potential dysregulation for study. Uh, so the studies, the pathways that they're interested in looking at in the future include tRNA biosynthesis, ENOS regulation, and regulation of lipid metabolism. This is a very convoluted map. You're not meant to read all of it, but it's to show that via metabolite mapping, they're able to provide evidence for widespread downstream cellular dysregulation in, that comes in contact with many critical mitochondrial and extra mitochondrial pathways. So in summary, uh, the summary of the metabolomics findings include combined LCF, CMS, and HMR data revealed new pathways for cellular dysfunction and widespread mitochondrial extra and or widespread mitochondrial and extra mitochondrial dysfunction, including insulin signaling, phospholipids, and these provide potential areas for the clinical investigation and therapeutic targeting in Barr syndrome. Dr. Vernon would like to acknowledge the Barth clinical team at Johns Hopkins University, uh, Cleveland State University, Dr. Yana Sandlers. Uh, she's also graciously agreed to answer questions about the metabolomics if you guys have them, as she's a lot more qualified than me. Um, RTI International, AI DuPont, the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, and a special thank you to the patients and their families for your participation. Thank you guys. Thank you, Brittany. I know how difficult that is to do in areas that you may not have some expertise in. Uh, so, thank you. That was a very exciting, you know, wonderful data. So, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, this piece of it that relates to glycerophospholipids in plasma. Did these include cardiolipins and monolysic cardiolipins or not? That Yana can help answer questions about the metabolomics. Thank you, Yana. Uh, I'm part of this project, and I'm Jana Sandlers from Cleveland State University. So uh, we used um, certain kits, uh, and um, the actual analysis was run with RTI International. Uh, this kit does not include cardiolipin uh, measurements. Well, the reason I'm asking about this is uh, the following, that... Uh, we now uh, develop more and more understanding that it's not only heart, but it's a systemic, so to speak, uh, condition that many other tissues may be affected. And whatever gets into plasma may reflect the real damage that happens in other tissues. And this has been shown, for instance, in cardiac arrest. You can see it so that the major problem is the neuronal damage but you can see reflection of this neuronal damage as you see respective species of cardiolipin in plasma. So in exactly the same way, it may very well be very promising and interesting to see what happens in uh, conditions of uh, Barr syndrome. So whether uh, appearance of the, refle uh, the respective species of cardiolipins and maybe monolysed cardiolipins in plasma 
will be diagnostic and predictive of potential damage. Thank you for that comment. Are there any other questions or comments? So you said new pathways were identified. Which ones? That is a great question. Um, well, the three that she was looking to study um, were on The th these are the three that I know they're most interested in looking at next. Perhaps Yana might have a better answer than I. So the idea was, we all know that metabolomics is more data-driven than hypothesis-driven research. So the idea was um, to use um, this type of project and see if we can validate some already known clinical markers. So we did validate in terms of amino acid levels. We did validate, first of all, um, this specific project, this specific study. And um, we found from uh, passive enrichment analysis some abnormalities that are extra mitochondrial abnormalities. For example, some abnormalities in uh, tRNA biosynthesis or ENOS uh, regulation. Well, we have to understand that in order to validate and um, make up some new hypothesis on these pathways, we need some future studies. But it just, you know, um, this study was just as an early step to validate what we already know from clinical studies and see if we can come up, can come up with new targets. Thank you again, Brittany.